Hey, Bible readers, I'm Tara Lee Cobble, and I'm your host for the Bible Recap. Today we drop back in on Moses' speech to the new generation of Israelites before they enter the Promised Land. This is his final locker room talk. He's recounting all the ways they've made bad plays in the past, and he's going over the plays they want to execute well in the future. He tells them that the wilderness was a test to refine them, and it's clear that the Promised Land will be a test as well. It's not some kind of end game for them, some kind of reward where they can just kick back and do whatever they want. They personally won't retain the land unless they respond to God's covenant promise by worshiping Him alone. The promised land is just another part of God's process to restore wicked humanity in relationship with Himself. And He knows how this next step will turn out, too. He's not testing them for His sake. He's testing them for their sake. This generation had yet to encounter anything that was really a result of their own actions. They had to endure at least a portion of the 38 years of wilderness that their parents received as punishment, but they weren't complicit in the rebellion at Kadesh Barnea, so this wasn't a punishment for them even though they had to endure it just like their parents did. I'm sure it felt like punishment at times, but it wasn't done in response to anything they had done. For them, it was discipline. It was training in how to respond to hardship and how to trust God. It's important to make a distinction between punishment and discipline. And in fact, for all those of us who know Christ, all our punishment has been absorbed by Him on the cross. If you've been adopted into God's family, you are His forever. And you can rest assured that he is never punishing you. He might be disciplining you, as any good father does, but you will never, ever, ever see his wrath. Not ever. Christ absorbed it all on the cross. It's not that we don't deserve punishment. We absolutely do. It's all we deserve. But Christ took what we deserved and gave us what we could never earn, eternal love and acceptance into God's family forever. The Israelites needed to be humbled, despite 400 years of slavery. They needed to be tested to see what was in their own hearts, to see who they really are. They also needed to see His provision, to see who He really is. He tested them, and He provided for them. They always had food and clothes. Even their feet didn't swell. And I've been in that desert, and I can tell you that's a miracle. I was there for 24 hours, and my ankles were the size of my knees. They were there for 40 years. Moses wants to remind them of all God has done, because honestly, Given their track record, he knows what to expect from them. Yesterday, he warned them against one particular kind of wrong thinking, and I mentioned that we'd encounter two more today. Yesterday's first warning was against fear and mistrusting God. Do you remember what the antidote to fear was? I'll give you a second. He told them to recall who God is and what he has done for them. We see him reference the same antidote today for two entirely different kinds of wrong thinking. Today, in his second warning against wrong thinking, which comes in 8, 17 through 18, he says, Beware lest you say in your heart, My power and the might of my hands have gotten me this wealth. So while yesterday's warning was against fear, today we see him warning against pride. Prosperity can numb you to God's activity, even when God is the one who brought that prosperity. The third kind of wrong thinking that he warns them against comes in 9, 4. It says, Do not say in your heart, after the Lord your God has thrust them out before you, it is because of my righteousness that the Lord has brought me in to possess this land. This third warning is also against pride. The second warning was against pride in their efforts, and this warning is against pride in their righteousness. It's interesting that they have to be warned twice against pride and only once against fear. In our society that beefs us up and tells us it's all about us and what we deserve, we would do well to heed these warnings too. Pride makes us forget God just as much as fear does. Both kinds of wrong thinking, fear-based and pride-based, have their roots in forgetting God and fixing our eyes on ourselves and our enemies. The way to fight these kinds of wrong thinking is to remember who God is and what He has done. God says it's not because they're righteous that He gives them the land, but because the other nations are unrighteous. We can't earn God's blessings. They're a gift freely given to the undeserving. This is humbling, but it should also be comforting, and it should prompt us to stop striving for His approval and favor because it has already been granted to us in Christ. God blesses us because of His goodness, 
not ours. And in fact, right after Moses warns them against thinking it's because of their goodness, he gives them a very lengthy reminder of exactly how ungood they really are by going over five stories of their rebellion in the wilderness. The golden calf, the fearful rebellion at Kadesh Barnea, when they said they wouldn't go in to take the land, and three times when they grumbled over food and water, doubted his plan, and wished they were back in Egypt. God doesn't just want their obedience. He wants their affection and relationship. Moses reminds them that God's rules aren't about diminishing their joy or freedom, but about increasing it. God has chosen them and set them apart through no doing of their own, as we've seen time and time again, for their joy. In 1016, Moses uses a peculiar turn of phrase when describing how this all plays out. He tells them, circumcise your heart. We know that circumcision serves as a physical sign of the covenant between God and the Israelites, but this makes it clear that he wants a full transformation and commitment, spiritual, emotional, and mental. Because again, like we talked about yesterday, the ancient Hebrew word used for heart encompassed all those things. He goes on to tell them that one way they can demonstrate the love they've received from God is by caring for the fatherless, the widow, and the sojourner. Those would be the people among them who typically don't have any physical land or inheritance. God commands for all of them to be taken care of by their unique nation-state community. And you may recall that this same sort of provision is made for the Levites, who also have no land inheritance. We continue to see God showing us how attentive and thoughtful He is toward the have-nots. What was your God shot today? I loved this little moment in 10, 14 through 15. It says, Behold, to the Lord your God belong heavens and the heaven of heavens, the earth with all that is in it. Yet the Lord set his heart in love on your fathers and chose their offspring after them, you above all peoples, as you are this day. God owns everything, yet he set his heart on me and on you. And not only is it not because of any good works or righteousness, but it's despite the fact that I lack those things. That kind of love is magnetic. When I stop to remember who I am and who he is, I can't help but be drawn to him. He's where the joy is. Hey, I just want to make sure we're all on the same page, literally. There are lots of chronological plans, and if you're using a different one, we'll probably get off track with each other at some point, though it could be months from now. So go ahead today and make sure you're either using the principal plan from our website, thebiblerecap.com forward slash start, or if you're using the Bible app plan to stay on track, make sure you're using the plan called The Bible Recap with Tara Lee Cobble. Just double check that it has our logo as the image. We've linked to both of those in the description box below.